Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hi there and welcome to Better System Trader. This is episode number 124 and this episode is a special one because last week the Better System Trader podcast reached the milestone of over 1 million downloads in iTunes. So thanks to everyone for joining in and being a part of this huge milestone. And we've got some more great content coming up too. I think you're really going to enjoy what we have planned for the next month or two. So keep on listening and spread the word to all of your trading friends. Tell everyone. Actually, if I can ask a quick favor to help me out, if you haven't left a rating or review of this podcast on iTunes yet, please go and do it now. It really does only take one minute to search for Better System Trader and leave a quick rating, but it'll really help to spread the word to other traders. So thanks a lot for doing that and helping out. Anyway, moving on to this episode now, we have a very special guest to mark a milestone episode, and our guest is Linda Rashke. Yes, Linda has been on the show before, back in episode 49, so it was a while ago, but it's really nice to have her back again. Now, in our previous chat with Linda, we focused on her approach to modeling the market, so we're going to continue on with that discussion now and turn our focus to trade management and exits instead, which Linda said is one of the most neglected aspects of trading. So in our chat with Linda today, she's going to share why trade management is such a neglected aspect of trading, and we're going to discuss how to model different types of exits and also the impacts of market environments on those exits. Linda is also going to share with us how volume can give clues about the tone of the market, how to use breadth measures in trading models, and also she's going to give us a little bit of info about the power of relative strength and how you can use it to target the best markets to trade. So Linda's got a lot of great insights to share with us today. I can't wait to share them with you. But first, let's hear a very quick message from our sponsor. The World Cup Championship of Futures Trading is proud to announce the Quarter 4 Equity Index Futures Trading Championship. The World Cup Trading Championships have been hosting successful trading competitions since 1984, and we've had quite a few of the previous winners on this very show. If you'd like to take part in showing the world your trading prowess and have the opportunity to win one of those coveted bull and bear trophies, the contest is free to enter. For more details, check out the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 123. And of course, trading futures and forex involve significant risk of loss and is not suitable for everyone. Okay, let's head on over to our chat with Linda. Hi Linda, welcome back. It's really great to have you on the show again. Great to be back, Andrew. Now, this is a special episode because the podcast has just passed 1 million downloads on iTunes, which is pretty amazing. And um, the podcast interview that we did together last year has had the most downloads out of every episode. So I think it's quite fitting to have such a, a special guest like yourself on a special milestone episode. So yeah, thanks a lot for coming on the show again. Well, congratulations to you and me. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, let's move on to trading now because that's what we're all here for. Now, in our previous podcast chat, there was a real focus around um, modeling the markets and how you approach the modeling and apply it to your trading. But there was a point that you um, you kind of touched on briefly in that chat that, that we didn't really get much time to explore deeply. And that was the topic of trade management. Okay. Um, now, you said trade management is probably the most neglected area of system development. So if you don't mind, I'd like to take the opportunity to dig into that a little bit more today. So are you good with that? Sure. Awesome. All right. Well, how about we just start with why do you think that trade management is such a neglected aspect of system development? Oh, I I think it's for two reasons. A, it's so much more fun for people to think about entries and be creative on that front. And the areas of, of exit strategies and initial risk and so forth tend to be a little bit more ambiguous. You know, I always said that if it was so clear cut that it's time for us to exit, if it was that strong of a signal, you would certainly be reversing your position. And it's not that way. So um, sometimes it's better when looking at exit strategies 
to think about two different topics. The first is, A, if it's going to be just a big, giant actuarial table, okay, because obviously you can have a well-defined entry, but we all know that probably 80% of your gains are going to come from 20% of the trades, and you just can't predict that. So if you think about that in terms of having an actuarial table type of exit, it gives you a departure point. And from there, the second vein is to categorize your uh, initial conditions that you're uh, putting on the trade and think about, can we say that this pattern does best with a, a small target or a big target, or is this a case where we want to trail a stop? And the majority of things that I've done in my work dictate either uh, exiting for a time of day exit or a fixed price exit as opposed to trailing a stop. But it's always very seductive to want to trail a stop, you know, on, on, on your positions. And, you know, you just have to be sensitive about how much give back you have. So this concept of trade management or position management should, should include your initial risk, but also protecting your open profits. Okay. Because once you know until the money's locked in it's not yours but you have to protect something of that you know and then of course we can go into correlations if you're dealing with a portfolio account management as well and then lastly if you're not so much of a system trader a mechanical system trader uh self-management has to be right up there on top of your list yeah. Okay. Well, let's just jump back a step and and just talk about the the types of exits that are available and perhaps the um the benefits or, or, or disadvantages of those types of exits. So you just mentioned mentioned a couple there. Can we just um go through the the types of exits that you think uh, are appropriate or that you use uh, yourself in your own trading? Well, I'll tell you how we do our modeling. We always have our initial entry, and then we look at how it does with several different types of exit strategies. Um, the first would be, uh, let's see here, uh, exiting at a fixed ATR price. Okay. For a small target, you could say what percent of the time can we get half of an ATR? And you can, you can of course gradiate these things and say, you know, what percent of the time do you get one ATR, three ATRs, so forth and so forth. Obviously the more that you play for, the win rate is going to drop down. So playing for a fixed ATR is, is one way to test it. A second way to test it is a, a, a time strategy. So what happens if I exit at the end of the day or at the next day's opening or the next day's close? Um, we have one model that we sit there and say, what happens if we exit seven days later versus 10 days later, that type of thing to see if there's a decay factor there. And of course, these things can vary greatly. That I just have to, to preface all of this, that when you do your modeling, the problem when you lump too much data together is that you start to lose the difference between the states. So for example, in a range-bound market, you're going to come up with, you know, 80% of the trades will model out this way. But obviously, if you have a breakout or a trend-following type of uh environment you know it's it's going to model out differently and if you lump those two together you're doing yourself a disservice in terms of really seeing the value of different exits so you know i always try to classify the patterns within this particular trading environment or state or i like to use the word structure you know the market structure so um so we've got the fixed atr type of exits we also have uh, time exits. Now, I'm not keeping, uh, I'm not touching yet on your initial risk points, how you do that, nor am I touching on trailing stops. But uh, trailing stops, of course, would be the next step. Um, you know, if I don't exit at a fixed point and I don't exit at a fixed time, what happens if I just trail a stop and see what the market gives me? And I think that's what most people with our human biases would prefer <laughs> to do, you know, because I hear a lot of crying if somebody exits at their fixed price, but then the market still extends its 
movement, you know, they're like, oh, I shouldn't have gotten out. But you can't look at it as one individual trade. You have to look at it across 500 trades. And the majority of the time, it would have been the correct thing to get out. So the trailing stop is an interesting thing because I spent way too much time on this trying to figure out, like, well, what is the best trail stop? Okay. And um, the answer is, one doesn't necessarily uh, is not necessarily superior to another. For example, if I test this on uh, a quarterly basis and I run my data, let's say just in buckets, well, if I optimized it, one bucket of data might say, you know, trailing a moving average stop. Another bucket might say, well, a volatility based stop was best. In other words, letting the market retrace back from its swing high or swing low, such as a chandelier type of stop. Um, you know, and another one, you know, you could simply uh, trail a parabolic in some environments, even though that never tests out to be optimal. So the moral of the story is, is that any trailing stop technique is going to keep you in on the very best trades. <laughs> You know, and and that's what we're really after. And if you do get stopped out, you can always set parameters to re-enter. You know, uh, people forget that. But if you don't stop yourself out, and it's a an ugly give back, you never get a chance to exit at that point that you should have. Yeah. Okay. So if I can just um, make sure I get the understanding of this modeling of exits, do you model each type of exit individually and then combine them in trading or do you model the combinations as well? Or how do, how do you work that, that difference there? Well, I had the most brilliant coder. I mean, he, his name was Nigel. I know he wrote some articles for Stocks and Commodities years ago. Um, very, very clever with his coding because, you know, you could always set a toggle switch uh, test it with exit one, test it with exit two, test it with exit three, and so forth. So once these toggle switches could be, uh, like I said, you know, toggle switch one is a price-based stop, second, you know, or price-based exit, you know, number two could be a time-based window, and you could, you could set the variables if you wanted to, you know, um, optimize this to see if there's a robust set of parameters there are you know um, data uh, variables there I mean that's that's what you really want if I'm doing a time-based exit I want to see that I still have a positive expectation whether I exit day seven day eight day nine day ten you know and in some environments you know day seven might be optimal but it doesn't really matter you want to see a cluster of you know uh, uh, parameters that it, it it works well with so Wait, we test each one individually, okay, because then you might want to optimize one of those little toggle switches. But then we, in our actual strategy, we'll usually combine two of them. So, for example, you, would, you might have a time-based stop that if it hasn't gotten stopped out by one method and it hasn't reached a target, but it's day eight, for example, you're best just to exit it. It's a dead market, you see? So that would be one of one of two parameters. Or, for example, you could have a, uh, a hard stop, which we usually keep our hard stops pretty far away. Um, but you could also have a, a variable stop, such as a volatility breakout system that trades in the opposite direction, so that that's a dynamic uh, stop changing with the market's overall environment, you know. Um, so we'll usually pick pick two different types, and, and that's how we would run with it. Yeah, okay. So you mentioned that sometimes you would hold a position overnight or, or for a couple of days, but those exits are, um, I think you said you categorize the entries and the, the conditions at the time of entry. Do you monitor the, the conditions during the trade and then perhaps adjust which type of exit you're going to use as things change? Or are you set, you know, at the time of entry, I'm going to use, uh, I hold this position overnight and that's it? Um, It really depends on the individual strategy, but what happens when you have a portfolio of strategies? Uh, I, I found it preferable. The type of trading that we did, which was a little bit more uh, short-term in orientation than, say, for example, a classic trend-following system, is that 
a lot of strategies sort of cancel each other out or work for stops for each other. So for example, let's say that you have a breakout pattern or a, a new momentum um, indicator that signals that you could have a run, you know, an extended run of uh, multiple days, six days, eight days, 10 days in a row type of thing, because these markets are so efficient nowadays. They are just, I've never seen such efficiency that once the market tips its hand, you know, you can get uh, eight days, low to high, low to high, low to high, you know, whereas before we might've had a little bit more of a consolidation or a little continuation pattern for me. You just don't see that as often. So it really pays to try and press those trades and stay with them. On the other hand, you know, we might be trading a volatility breakout system against that. So while you have your trend, which could have a duration, you know, holding period of like eight or nine days, on the other hand, these markets tend to get uh, very crowded very quickly. So the liquidation flushes can be quite severe or a short covering reaction can be quite severe. And just a simple volatility breakout system to trade against that it's kind of interesting because the volatility breakout system will make money, say, in one day and out the next. Thank you very much. You know, but meanwhile, the market gave back four days gains. But once the volatility breakout system is exited, which is usually a 24-hour period holding time, then you start back up again in the original direction of the trend. So, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. You know, most of our modeling really comes from – just two to three parameters. So uh, because it's not so sophisticated, um, these collection of, of strategies really work well together. Mm, yeah. When you were creating those models, were you thinking about, you know, these strategies that kind of offset each other? Was that by design or did it just happen over time? Or what? It just ends up working out that way. It wasn't like, a, you know, we try to create one strategy that will dovetail with another that will dovetail yeah. with another. And most of our models or strategies arise from asking simple questions. You know, that's how we go about what happens if the market takes out the first hour's range. What happens if the market closes, you know, at 5%, you know, of its high or low, you know, what happens if, and you start always asking those if questions and out of that, you see if you can get some kind of edge or expectation. Yeah. Okay. I just want to dig a little bit deeper into these market conditions. So you mentioned that you categorize them on entry and, and that you do look at market conditions during the day. What, what kind of things are you looking at to kind of maybe give you a clue that perhaps the mood of the market is changing and you need to switch uh, the way you approach it? What, what are you looking for? It, well, it's not so black and white. And especially, you know, I, I try to follow a portfolio of non-correlated markets. So I'm, I'm, I'm dealing more with the futures market. So we've got agriculture, metal, energy, currencies, bonds. And um, it, it's pretty neat because there's always something happening somewhere. But with that said, um, believe it or not, you can still look at the volume for the NYSE in the first 30 minutes, and it's going to set the tone for a good part of the day for most of these markets, you know, barring the fact that you're going to have an FOMC announcement, you know. But I think that would be an indication of perhaps the time of year, if it's the third week in August and everybody's out at the Hamptons or, you know, the Europeans are on vacation or whatever, it's probably going to show up, you know, um, whereas you have perhaps uh, periods in January or at certain times in the quarter where you have uh, heavier money flows, you know, either, uh, you know, money that's got to be put to work at the end of the month or the beginning of the month or quarter. And that sort of seems to disperse itself across most of the financial markets and, and even spill over into some of the energies and, and so forth. It's, it's sort of an interesting phenomenon. It's like, all the higher time frame players, you know, to quote that terminology, you know, um, or the big, big boys or whatever, they're either all around or they're not. So, I mean, just looking at the volume for the NYC actually works well for me. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Linda. Now, I just want to ask a little bit more about trade management. So we've just kind of had a chat about exits there. Are there any other components to trade management that uh, people need to consider? Sure. You know, you've got to watch your correlation because I'll tell you how we calculate our unit size. Um, and we recalculate this at the end of every quarter. I take the dollar range for the day, uh, an average of that for each individual market. So, for example, let's say that the S&Ps have a daily range of 12 points, you know, and corn actually had a daily range of 20 cents, you know, that would mean that the dollar range for corn is greater than the dollar range for the S&Ps, meaning that I would trade more S&Ps per million dollars than I would corn. Okay. So <laughs> it, I, I, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's a paradox. You'd think corn would be a dull market, but I can remember periods where the dollar average dollar range for corn was much greater than the S and P. So never say never. Right. But obviously uh, silver could be one of the uh, more extreme markets. Um, and at times natural gas has been. And so, and, and even crude oil. So I'm going to adjust I'll take a 20-day um, a moving average of its um, daily range and then multiply that by the dollar amount, you know, that it moves. And then that way I'm, I'm always, you know, trading. Uh, I, I don't worry about the margin on it, but it makes a nice um, – guideline to to split up your unit size and then I can always choose to do half a unit or a full unit and you know if I'm trading larger amounts in the account then you know or I, I add money into the account then I adjust the unit size to that if I wanted to scale down and and take money out of the account then my unit size shrinks accordingly so you know therefore when you make your trade it's always the same, uh, you know, uh, risk, if you will, per whatever unit you want to calculate it into, 10,000, 100,000, a million, you see. And uh, I've, I've found that that way you're always adjusting with the volatility of the market. So I can remember when I was trading many years ago and the dollar range for gold was under $300 a day. And, uh, you know, now we've seen it be up to $2,000 a day. So obviously you would trade much fewer contracts per uh, million or whatever your, you know, count size is, uh, I'll, I'll say $50,000, uh, you know, than you would have perhaps years ago. And so then, of course, you have to watch the correlation because you can have periods where the bonds are correlated, gold's correlated, the yen's correlated, and you have you have uh, trades working in all these markets simultaneously. You know, you don't. It could be a triple whammy if you're on the wrong side. So that's also a very important consideration. So, you know, if we have positions on in in very correlated markets, we might only do half a unit in each one to avoid that. You know, big event risk or uh, you know those types of variables. Mm. And so, how how often do you do you actually measure the correlation, or is it just something that you notice by looking at the markets? I love using Steve Moore's site, Moore Research Center. He's been a good friend for so long, and um, he publishes tables for free on his site. It's mrci.com. Just fabulous research and data you know he, he's got monthly cash charts going back 30 years all of this stuff for free as as well as all the correlation tables and you can you can set it to 90 days back 180 days back so um anytime somebody else who's whose work i respect you know offers it out there for free <laughs> I'm, I'm going to save myself a few a few hours of time and use their work yeah, that's always a good thing, isn't it? Totally. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, I remember from our last conversation, um, you mentioned that you did some modeling around breadth and, and some of those um, internal measures. Can you uh, kind of give us an indication of some of the basic concepts and applications uh, you see for trading with those measures? 
Sure. You know, I uh, when I started, it was like in 1981, and I had a mentor, uh, Jerry Watson, who was actually a mathematician, and I think he had started off with a brokerage firm before um, getting a seat on the Pacific Coast Exchange himself. This was like, I think he started in 1978 or 79 down there. Um, and I'm not sure where he learned it. You know, all this stuff kind of gets taught down through the grapevine and passed on. But I used to keep track of... Um, the trend and the breadth readings and the put call ratios and shorts, you know, specialist shorts, uh, a, a few indicators that I don't use anymore today. And that fell by the wayside, obviously specialist shorts you don't care about these days, you know, but I used to keep track of them by hand. And, um, at the time, for example, uh, boy, a 10-day moving average of the trend was so powerful in identifying overbought and oversold conditions. Um, that's kind of fallen by the wayside the last 10 or 15 years because you, we had we had a couple super big low-priced stocks, you know, um, tons of volume that would just skew these things. Um, so you have to be careful and always assess, you know, if things are changing. I, I don't use that trend anymore. But breadth has always been a well um, – uh, you know, thought of type of indicator. And, and now the trick is that there's different databases by which you can get your, your breadth readings. Uh, it's not a standard broadcast uh, measurement like by a, a data feed, you know, like for example, my CQG is going to have a different database that it calculates breadth on than my trade station is going to have a different database. So you've got a little bit of that. What, you know, are, are they including, you know, ETFs? Are they including uh, bond funds? Are they including, you know, all, all kinds of different products out there? So a lot of people such as Larry McMillan um, keep stock only, you know, breadth, versus, you know, that, that database that might include ETFs and so forth. Um, so you just have to be a little bit careful of that. But the general principle is that if you are in a range-bound market, um, breadth oscillators can serve as overbought and oversold indicators. Um, more popularly now, I think people prefer to see a divergence where breadth makes a higher low and the indices make a lower low. Um, then I think you've got a little bit higher confidence factor to hang your hat on. Um, I'll tell you one of the lessons I learned the hard way, of course, like all of them. And, um, <laughs> you know, and this was like very early on, we're, you know, talking 30 years ago, but thinking that just because the breadth oscillator was overbought that is not a sell signal um, and a, a more popularized uh, indicator now would be that concept of breadth thrust so you actually want to see a breadth oscillator get very overbought to confirm the fact that there could be the beginning of an uptrend, you see. So um, it, it, it's still going to come down to a little bit of the um, basic premise that we uh, put directional oscillators in, you know, having to quantify the environment that it's in. If it's a breakout, you definitely want to see a breadth oscillator make new highs because then it, it says that you've got a lot of participation on that breakout, you know, and, and then it'll have some legs to carry. So just a, just a little bit tricky there, but I, I do have to say I, I've gotten more keen on only – looking at the breadth making new highs as well as uh, the divergences in breadth, no matter what database you're using to calculate your breadth. Yeah. So do you think that these um, these measures that are not really based on price but the underlying behavior, how important do you think they are in the role of trading compared to just price only? I think you're dealing with different schools and different – populations, I don't see individual traders using them so much as I do 
on the institutional side where they have a longer time horizon and they're worrying more about positioning their clients or a portfolio a certain way. I don't see the same aggressiveness with individual traders trying to time that, you know, big drop or, you know, the, those types of things um, using these market internal indicators like we would have 20 or 30 years ago. But on an institutional um, basis, you know, they're, they're, it's very popular and it's very powerful. And I think that it's one of 10 kind of classes that would be used to uh, make decisions, including sentiment. You know, all, all these big institutional desks and analysts are very keen on the importance of sentiment these days, which they didn't look at so much 15 years ago. But, uh, geez, everybody's gotten pretty wise to the good stuff. Yeah. You've got me interested now. You said 10 different classes. Can you mention a few others? I mean, you don't need to go through all, all 10, but what other kind of classes do you think that they're looking at? That, that well, are- you can look at like up volume, down volume ratio. I like to do a lot of work with the ticks and the closing ticks, but that's pretty correlated to the breadth. You know, obviously the volatility uh, indicators such as the VIX or the, uh, you know, the spreads between the contracts, the VIX contracts, um, you know, that's pretty popular now. A lot of people look at the, the you know, the options on the VXX. Um, so that would be a, a group. Like I said, the, uh, the um, sentiment types of, of readings, you know, are, are very popular. I don't know if I mentioned things like up volume, down volume. That's kind of gotten skewed. Uh, I think Lowry's did the best work on that initially uh, 10, 12 years ago. But the problem is, you know, a lot of this stuff changed when they changed the uh, tick size on the stocks. You know, when everything went to pennies, you know, it's uh, it seemed like we started and they took away the, uh, you know, the shorting rule so you can short with abandon on down ticks and so forth we started seeing this uh, increase like tenfold increase in the 90 percent up days and the 90 percent down days so i i sort of take some of that with a, a grain of salt now um put call ratios you know there's another class for you that kind of falls under the sentiment uh so that you know that's that gives you a good idea there. Yeah. All right, thanks, Linda. Now, I just want to um, touch on uh, one more topic before we finish up for today. Um, now, it's based on a um, – I don't know if you remember that in our last podcast episode, we had a bunch of questions that were submitted by listeners. And there was one question – I think it might have actually been the last question um, that was asked. I kind of let it slide on by because we were running out of time. So I just want to ask you this one again. Now, I've got it here. The question was from Marcus, and Marcus said, is there any single key understanding of the markets that you now know that you wish you had discovered a long time ago? And uh, your response was relative strength. It took me about 15 years to figure out the power of relative strength, and it's huge. So um, now that we've got a few minutes, can I ask you to explain what is the power of relative strength that really appeals to you, and how does that actually feed into your trading? Well, it's um, several ways. Of course, there's a, a whole arena of strategies that we can do with stocks and ETF on relative strength basis, everywhere from looking at, uh, you know, a long time horizon, how it's performing, you know, 10 days, 90 days, you know, whatever, relative to an index or, or, or its own group. So I'm not going to go into that because there's plenty that's been written on that. Um, but the, the nice thing to understand about relative strength, it's the most raw way of looking at an immediate supply demand imbalance and, and where the dollars are going. And the market has become so urgent, you know, in the last 10 years, everything is leap and then look, you know, <laughs> everybody's afraid of missing out. So you just get these yeah. incredible dog piles, you know, very efficient moves, uh, that, that tend to peter out pretty quickly too. But you know, believe it or not, it, it works great. I can come down in the in the morning, and we've had all the evenings trading, you know, by you guys in Australia and Europe, of course. But I have a, a, a little trade station grid that will have 20 futures markets up on it. And I can look at the top three uh, that's showing up in terms of the best. Let me see. What is this? 
best percent move off the opening price. Okay. And the opening now, keep in mind the opening was the evening before I'm in the U S session. So it'd be the opening of the new day. And, uh, then of course you have staggered openings because the softs like sugar and cocoa and those types of markets, uh, don't open right away. They open up a little later. So even with these staggered, uh, openings and uneven, uh, field there, I can look at the top three, uh, in, in my, in my, list the trade station radar scan is god knows the most beautiful simple indicator in the world to have and i can look at the bottom three and if i told myself i am only going to make long trades on those top three uh relative strength leaders let's see what they were today oh i should well right now everything's just reopened so it's going to be not valid um and and only trade the bottom three to the short side, I'll get a win loss ratio of 80%. You know, it's, it's just amazing. The duration of that edge might only last one day. And of course, you know, some days it, it does that test and then reject, it might reverse, you know, uh, midstream. Um, but overall, you know, if you're just a short term day trader or something, Scalp the ones to the long side at the top of the list. Scalp the ones to the short side and the bottom list. So that's a very practical, easy, simple strategy if you don't want to have overnight risk to come in and, and, and pick the stocks or the futures that are in play. That's what you really want to do. You, you, if you're a trader, you're seeking opportunity. You know, traders are like moths to light, you know, when it comes to volatility we want to play where there's the volatility. We want to play where there's the crazy radical movement because, you know, that's where there's opportunity and edge. So this is one way of sort of getting that main idea right, that these are going to be the most volatile or the most uh, in play. And, th and that's what you want. Yeah. So if you trade um, mean reversion strategies, would you still pick the top three to do long positions in mean reversion or would you switch that around depending on the style? Lordy, no. I don't want to short the relative strength leaders, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to do mean reversion on that. You know, I, I want to – if I'm doing a mean reversion strategy, I definitely want something that's uh, in a range-bound consolidating type of environment. I don't want to be uh, – trying to pick tops or bottoms. I, I want I want to do mean reversion against well-defined support and well-defined resistance levels. You know, however you want to define that is up to you via a higher time frame or a volume distribution or some other type of structure, you know, uh, pullbacks to moving averages, you know, on two 40-minute charts. I mean, there's a zillion ways that you can, you can do that. But uh, mean reversion is a strategy that really needs to be played in a, a, a certain type of environment, which actually, if you, if you like fading, you know, trades, I mean, the market tends to be in those environments uh, most of the time, uh, you know, good old consolidation, trading range, and so forth. Yeah, so, so in that case, are you saying that you'd pick something more in the middle of that list as long as the volatility is there? Well, keep in mind that this is only – for that day coming in if i'm if i'm doing a mean reversion strategy you know in general i i just don't want to be picking the most you know oversold for that day and trying to pick when they're going to stop going down i mean it might be a good candidate the next day but it's sort of analogous to if you're familiar with the volatility breakout system i i use that just because most people are familiar with that. It's a pretty generic concept having range expansion, you know, range expansion that, that pulls you in. And, and that range expansion can just be a one day phenomena. But I don't want to step in front of that range expansion. If I want to do mean reversion, I'm going to wait till it's just towards the close of that day and it's already flushed everybody out you know <laughs> then then yeah. when, you know when it's it's squeezed that last person maybe it's a better a better time to to go in but not not in the mid-morning yeah so just want to clarify when you're looking at this list did you say you're looking at the percentage moves for the day uh, do you take into account volatility of that instrument let's see this is just this trade station it has nothing to do with, it's it's very generic okay it's just mm. it's the net 
percent movement off the opening price. I'm sure you could right. refine that and, and you know make it into ATR functions or uh, you know dollar range functions, but it's just the net percent off the opening price. And you know I I'm just using that as an example. I I mean in yeah. general I I tend you know, to use other types of, of uh, strategies or approaches, you know, uh, more often. But it, but it, this, you know, this will work great. The concept, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Thanks for sharing that, Linda. Um, now, I want to start wrapping up. Uh, usually we do the, the closing questions, but we've done that before. So I don't think we'll bother with that for this time. But so how can listeners get in touch with you or learn more from you? Well, I have a website that is a blog that I've probably written a, a blog post maybe three times in the last eight months. So <laughs> you, you, you have to ignore that. I'm not, a, I'm not a writer or a blogger, but I do have a lot of interesting articles archived. And uh, I mean, one of these days I'll be more active on there. It just seems to be a time issue. But there is a contact me type of little box. And Boy, it's so funny. I, I just got an email from somebody, and they wrote me a little mini War and Peace novel. I mean, oh, <laughs> and I, I will write you guys back. It might not be that day. It might be one week or two weeks, but I will read anything you want to write and respond to it best to my ability. And, you know, it's it's really fun. It's really fun hearing about other people's journeys from around the world, you know, and I was so fortunate and blessed, you know, when I was coming along through all the years, all the people that helped me and mentored me and gave me feedback and, you know, uh, supported me. Now it's kind of fun just to hopefully share, you know, oh yeah, all this bad shit happened to me too, you know, all these bad learning experiences and so forth and, and you know, maybe encourage some other people or, or give them feedback. And as a, as a disclaimer, I do not sell anything. I have never sold courses. I don't have a chat room. I don't do mentoring. I'm not selling books, you know. So <laughs> anything I give to you is just coming straight from the heart. There's no ulterior motive there. Yeah. And you've got plenty of YouTube videos and interviews and all kinds of oh stuff. Oh, my gosh. Everything out there for free, really. I, I really could write like five books on all that stuff and probably make a million dollars, but it's probably never going to happen. So you're better off just looking at the YouTube videos. <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks, Linda. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we wrap it up for today? Oh my goodness, Andrew! All I will say if, if if you get people, um, you know, asking questions or wanting to delve into a certain topic, my goodness, you have so many interesting people on all your blogs that have covered so many different arenas. But if you ever want, I'm 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 here to to share, and uh, you know, if you ever want to do a follow up one, just call me anytime. I like hearing how things are going on the opposite side of the world. <laughs> You'll have to come and visit one day. Come back to Australia. I, I'm coming to Australia next fall. I'm going to be yes. there in 2018 in Melbourne. That's right. I know. And that's going to be great. We're going to get together and have a good dinner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Linda. I really do uh, appreciate you sharing all of your loads of knowledge and your insights. And I'm sure people are going to find a lot of value in what you've shared today. So thanks again. And I do wish you all the best. All right, I'd say good night, but I really have to say good morning, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, it's morning here. Yeah. You have a good night. <laughs> All righty, bye. Cheers, Linda, bye. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. <laughs> <laughs>